here we are. Hey, Geekon, I hope you are here. I cannot see you because of the spotlights, but uh, I hope you're there, and I hope you're having uh, some fun today. I, I, really come, I really like coming here, because it's the only time of the year when I'm actually in the cinema. It's a shame I can't watch any movies, though. Anyway, uh, welcome to my talk, Unicorn's Baby Steps. And this talk will be about the first steps of a startup CTO. My name is Sebastian Gamsky. I'm a principal architect in uh, Amazon Web Services. And if you want to learn a little bit more, you can use those social links. What you should really know about me for this particular talk is that I'm a former VP of engineering and CTO for some product organizations and startups. And actually, for the last few years, on a daily basis, I cooperate with startups across the whole Europe, Africa, Middle East. So that's one of the main reasons why I, I've picked this particular topic. Uh, in general, I'm also with two of my friends, Wojtek Tak and Tomek Gonishko. I'm co-hosting something which is mentioned here at the slide, which is called CTO Morning Coffee. And this is very related to the topic of the today's talk. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, being the startup CTO. And what's in it for me or for you? Because this slide is written from, from your perspective. So uh, I'm not going to convince you to, to, to create a startup, to organize a new startup. This talk is more about the technical leadership. And being the startup CTO is just one of the good examples of being a technical leader. So this talk is actually not for startup CTOs. I, I would even ask you who of you is a startup CTO, but I cannot he see you, I cannot see your hands, so it would be pointless. Uh, but uh, the idea here is to, to think about future and to think about being an entrepreneur, to think about uh, stepping one step or one uh, long step further in your own career, and maybe this is a path for you. Maybe leadership is a path for you, and as an aspiring leader, as a software engineer, this may be an interesting experience. You may learn some unknown unknowns here, and I hope it will be fun. Uh, the plan is very simple, so uh, I'm not going to talk about like a lot of theory. I'm not going to talk about how startups are being formed, just a few tiny aspects which are important from the perspective of the CTO. Then we'll try to uh, somehow create a mental model for the initial steps of the startup journey. We'll talk about a few very inconvenient truths. So there will be some controversial things that may spark some uh, discussion, hopefully. And in the end, I will try to leave you with some parting words. So you can apply that even if you are not planning to be a startup CTO, actually. A few disclaimers, because there always has to be some legal comments. Uh, so yeah, first of all, those, op those opinions are mine, not my employer. So this is not any kind of official AWS PR statement or anything. So uh, feel free to blame me if, if you don't like, don't agree with stuff. Uh, this is not really about JVM or technology. This, will, this is more about engineering and leadership. So be prepared for that. I hope that this is uh, according to your expectation. And there's one more thing, one more convention I use in my presentation. So there is a small golden light bulb on this slide. And typically, you can see such light bulbs on many other slides. And it means that next to the light bulb, there's a reference. So if you enjoy or if you are interested in what's in the slide, feel free to use this link, use this reference to learn a little bit more. All right, let's start. So what is startup? Everyone knows what is startup because you know startups. But what is startup? What in startups is more in most interesting from the perspective of this startup CTO? Well, uh, I've enumerated three things. You may agree or not. So high ambiguity. So startups in general operate in a space where there is there are plenty of risks. There are plenty of questions. There are few answers, and there's a lot of hypotheses. And you may be right. You may be wrong. In general, many people are wrong. Much, much more of them are wrong. Uh, startups are growth-oriented, not profitability-oriented, at least initially. This is how it works. This is because of how financing the startup works. So in general, it's, it's maybe quite counterintuitive for many people who, who have run traditional businesses. And startups need some sort of competitive edge, why they are better or why they are more effective, more efficient than their organizations. And they achieve that thanks to so-called low inertia. So they need to operate fast. They need to uh, act fast. They need to be very agile in a different word than traditional agile. So uh, this is what really distinguishes uh, startups 
from the perspective of a technical leader, and this will have some serious implications in the rest of the presentation. All right, so who's the CTO, Chief Technology Officer? Uh, there is no single answer, of course, because there is no single rule book for CTOs or no single rule book for startups, CTOs. Uh, I've met plenty different profiles, and these three, I think, they are most popular ones. And probably architect and head of delivery are like 90% uh, of all of those. So what's the difference? Architect is basically a person who uh, owns the technical vision of the product, what this particular startup is creating. Uh, maybe this is the person who has originated something which is the foundation of the competitive edge of this organization, like a superb algorithm or some incredible framework that is behind. Or maybe this person has created the open source product, which is the core of the open core uh, for, for this particular uh, online product. So the architect is the brain behind that. And it doesn't mean that this person tells other people what to do on a daily basis. It doesn't have to be like that. So another archetype or another profile is head of delivery. Who's head of delivery? So this person is more like a manager who organizes things. So it's a manager who creates the processes, who actually builds the organization. It's the one who operates the engineering organization. It's completely different. This person is a great organizer. It's a boss. It's a typical boss, not an architect. Uh, advocate, advocate is something completely different, and it's specific to a particular types of organization, uh, especially the ones who create technical products which are being consumed by other technical organizations. So in those organizations, you need someone who will be a liaison of your technology, uh, someone who will be a salesperson to technical people, someone who is credible, someone who is an engineer, and who is able to talk to other engineers. So if you, for instance, know Amazon's uh, CTO, Werner Vogels, he's actually an advocate. Werner has very few people in his organization, like three or four, and he's no one's boss. He doesn't tell what will be the next release of EC2 or S3. No, it's, this is not his role. So, so these are the three main, I would say, profiles of a CTO. But that's not all. You can take a look at this role from a little bit different, let's say, dimension, uh, because each CTO, regardless of this profile, is wearing several hats. And those two are the major ones, I would say. Uh, each CTO should wear, at least partially, and uh, of course the ratio between those can differ, two hats, the hat of the leader and the hat of the manager, because this is not the same thing. So the leader basically is leading people, and the manager is managing systems. So the leader doesn't have to, to be the head in the, of the hierarchy, it doesn't have to be someone who is like formally, uh, who has formal authority over other people, the leader doesn't have to be someone else's boss. The leader has to influence because of his uh, knowledge, former experience, being right in general, and his charisma, or her charisma, of course. And in general, uh, this is, I would say, an influence, not utilizing the Kira in the organization. So probably if you take a look at the organization where you work right now, you see such people. People who may be leaders, even if you are not your bosses. They are the ones everyone listens to if they speak in the room, even if they are not the highest paid people in the room, or even if they are not the actually the ones in charge. So the, the main thing here is that even if you, for instance, it's natural for you to be a leader but not a manager, when you are the CTO in the organization for the very first time, it's up to you to choose which hat would you like to wear or which hat would you like to wear more, but still there has to be someone who will wear the other hat. So you either need to delegate or you need to organize your organization in a way that this hat will be not abandoned. And yes, there will be plenty of references to interesting books. This is one of them. There are many good books on leadership and many good books on management, especially in the IT, in, in the, let's say, technology space. But if you want a book about both of those, this is probably the one you should try. And uh, if you don't know who Michael Lop is, he goes by Rants on the internet, so you probably already know who's that. Who's that. All right, so let's try to, before we dump, jump into startup's DNA, let's talk a little bit about the startup journey. Because the fact is that uh, I presented you a simple mental model about the who CTO is, however, this changes. This changes 
uh, even in the early stage, a startup grows, as products get much, gets more mature, it really changes. So uh, these are my four stages, my four phases that I would like to distinguish. They are quite highly conceptual, and sometimes the borderlines are quite uh, fuzzy. Uh, but still, we, we need to model it somehow. All right, the first one, envisioning. So the startup is being born. And we are not talking here about many additional things like financing and so on. Let's focus on those things that may be really surprising to the CTO. So as you can see, because you've probably taken a brief look at the slide, there's not technolo much technology here. The key concerns of the CTO are actually about what kind of problem are we trying to solve. We are, we are not talking about solutions yet. We are talking about problems. Uh, so uh, what kind of unique value proposition I'm, are, we, are we aiming for? And in which space are we going to operate? So is this space already somehow uh, settled? Is there anyone settled there? Who will we compete against? And, and, and who would be the actual user? Who, who would be their re reception of this? And uh, these are good questions. And CTO is supposed to be a technology officer. These are not really technical. But without that, without asking yourself those questions, actually, how do you make sure that your technology will contribute to the goal of this organization? So that's why you should self-reflect and, uh, and just answer yourself honestly a question. Do I really understand the problems that are supposed to be solved? And do I really already start to see how the technology will solve those problems? Because not all problems can be solved with technology. And in some cases, the technology is actually not the most important things when it comes to solving those problems. And this is already a good moment when you need to start uh, validating the truth. Because you, you probably heard the term, the term bias. So we all have our opinions, but opinions do not matter as much as facts. So. Uh, if you think, for instance, that there is a niche for a particular product, there is some sort of space, you should back this up with some facts. And it may be hard, especially in some new niche area, because those facts may be not collected yet or hardly achievable. So uh, what typically happens in, in such cases, you need to support the hard data with the anecdotal data. You should actually go somewhere and ask people. <laughs> That's something what we did. We, we were creating an, a startup in the beauty and wellness industry. Uh, as, as you can see, I don't have personally much in common with beauty and with wellness. Uh, so it was quite new for me. But uh, we actually went out there to barbers, hairdressers, and so on. And we've talked to those guys. We've introduced ourselves. And we asked them about their everyday problems. And they thought we are some weird weirdos, basically. <laughs> but that's how we, how we actually learn, learned things. That's how we validated our assumptions. So uh, it's at this point, at such an early stage, before the first commit of code is, is, is put in the repository, you already need to start working with the data. And uh, if you want to learn more about the organization which are driven by the product, but I don't mean theory, I mean practice. I strongly recommend this gentleman, Marty Kagan. Uh, he's a former founder of startups, uh, current investor, and he's a very smart guy. Has created a few books, and each of them are basically about product-driven organizations. Like, strongly recommended. This is not some theoretical stuff, this is practical stuff. So, uh, here, are, here are we. Uh, this is the phase two, and this is the moment where we actually start building things. And we want to look for something which is called product market fit. So for, for a product which actually corresponds to the needs. And this is a tricky moment. Because we are going to start building. We are going to start making commits. And the question is, what should we start with? This is not that easy. We have probably a very small team. We probably have not much money. Uh, our, our resources are limited. So those concerns are very valid. What do we need to prove to make sure that this organization can actually take off? What questions do we need to answer? So where are our main questions about our product? Because our product is probably something completely new. Maybe we have actually invented our industry. I've worked in the organization that has invented the whole industry. So there were questions about questions in this organization. And if you want to measure something, we need to understand what and how.
So uh, I will give you an example. And on the right here, you can see some very different things that can be the ones you would like to build first. So uh, here's one good example. Uh, if you take a look at, at the left, it's me. Or it's me mixed with a Skeletor from He-Man, one of my favorite characters. And this was uh, created by the software called Midjourney. It's a generative AI uh, software. And uh, if you think a little bit about this new wave of products, generative AI products, how do they win the market? Or which one will prevail? Which one will achieve the greatest success? What, what, what makes the winner here? They're probably the best model, <laughs> the best output, the best generated images, right? So uh, what will probably not make so much difference here? Shiny web application where you actually interact with this model. So do you know what these guys did, mid-journey guys? Actually, there is no mid-journey application. There is no web application. There is no mobile application. You join Discord server. There is a Discord bot. So if you want, the way I've generated this image is I just joined a Discord server, and I send a comment to the bot. You can see the comment at the right. It's a comment, imagine. So those guys haven't spent a single second on creating a new fancy web application for their service. Because they knew that it will not matter. Because what people care is those beautiful, shiny results. So I think that this is really a mind-blowing example how you should make decisions on what, do you, what you should start building to actually increase or maximize your chances of succeeding. I really love that. And this is uh, prioritizing those things and uh, deciding what to build first is, of course, about making decisions. And that's the moment when you should, uh, that's the moment in the life organization when you should think about how, as a CTO, uh, how should the decisions be made in your organization? Because at some point, at, at, at the moment, you may be the only single developer, or your, devel your team may be very small, your team may actually feed one room. But uh, you don't want to stay a bottleneck. You don't want the all the decisions coming through you. So you need to be able to somehow delegate the decisions in a way that you feel comfortable with and the people you delegate upon also feel comfortable with. So you need some sort of a framework or rule set or whatever of making the decisions. And here's the one that we use in Amazon. And this is not the only proper one. It's just very simple. So that's why I'm bringing it up here. So uh, before making the decision, we classify the decision. Is it a one-way door decision or two-way door decision? What does it mean? One-way door decision is, means that it will be very hard to change later. Hard to cancel, hard to adjust, because it will be expensive. It will be troublesome if you want to change it later. So these are typical decisions which have like a huge impact, high degree of risk. And on the other hand, there are two-way door decisions, which can be easily reversed or modified. So the risk here is limited. So when we do this classification, then we actually apply the way of making the decision. So in the first case, right, so if it's not reversible, we need to investigate. We need to research. We need to properly document. And when the decision is made, there is no exception. It's disagree and commit. We just go with this decision until some key conditions change or decision expires. So that's how we do it. And uh, that's just a single frame, simple framework. And maybe this one has worked well for us. Maybe your organization will need a different one. But you need, some, you need one. Uh, and if you want some sort of inspiration, here's another book. There will be plenty of books here. Uh, and this is actually a book about the culture of Amazon. And this book describes many mechanisms and many, I would say, techniques that are the basis of this organization's culture. And do not get me wrong, I'm not trying to convince you to copy those, because this is actually stupid. <laughs> Amazon is a completely different organization than the organization you work for or that you will build. Uh, but it's, it makes sense. This book is very useful when it comes to understanding how to build mental models or how to build mechanisms, what to build mechanisms for, what is the role. So that, that's, that's probably something that you can benefit uh, when you read this book. All right. Uh, Another interesting stage. So we already have some product market fit. 
which means that we have a solution to actual problem, which is already a lot. And here we are entering the stage when we actually have our first real clients and users. So there are people who somehow rely on what we've created. Maybe they pay for that, maybe they don't pay because this is our business model for now. But the point is that, yeah, like our key concerns as a CTO should be, uh, what do we actually promise our users, our customers at this point? Did we promise anything? Or uh, did we promise explicitly or maybe they assume some things? And how critical is our service to them? And what things can break, and what will be the implications of those things breaking? And if those things break, how will we know? Who will tell us? Will it be some raging user? Actually, does the raging user have any way to contact us? Because maybe not. And this leads to very interesting self-reflections. So at this point, when, when I'm already running on production, what do I know about this production? I probably have some technical monitoring. I see whether my processes are up or not. I see the CPU consumption. I see the memory consumption. I see my cloud bill. But how about business metrics? Do I know how many sessions are on? Do I know how many transactions are going through? Will I know if, for instance, my, uh, my payment provider is off? Uh, we, actually, in my, one of my organizations, we've learned it the hard way. So we've built quite a complex platform. And this complex platform was basically a SaaS for a particular type of businesses. And they were literally running the whole business on this SaaS, which means that they had their inventory there, they have the roster of their employees, they had all the bookings, it was possible to book an appointment because this was in the beauty and wellness. So, uh, so basically they could run their whole business using this piece of software. And it, it grew nicely. So we kept adding new capabilities, new functionalities. And at some point, unfortunately, bam, we had an outage in the middle of the day. And uh, the outage took like 20 minutes. And of course, like, uh, we jumped on that in pretty much immediately. Uh, but uh, that's when we actually learned how important this platform was for, for our users. Because literally, they were not able to run their business without the platform anymore. Why so? Because they have all the appointments in the platform. And it meant that, imagine that you are a hairdresser, you have a salon, and the platform is off. So you don't know, do I actually have an appointment in five minutes? Do I have any appointments today? So if there is a walk-in, a customer, a new customer walking from the street, and they would like to have a haircut, should I accept this person? Or maybe I have an appointment in five minutes, so there will be a quite a, a tension and unpleasant situation coming in. So uh, that's when we actually learned that this is not really super pleasant, and we need to do something about that. That's how we implemented for the very first time so-called graceful degradation, which means that even if we have an outage of our system, so the functionalities are in general down, we need at least some minimal read-only version so those salons can at least know what appointments they have already scheduled for today. Because this is the minimum of the functionality we need to provide even if we are down as a platform. So this was a painful lesson, one of the painful lessons that we had. Uh, so all of those things that I've mentioned uh, Right now, at this point, the organization is quite complex. There are some things you promise in an explicit or non-explicit way. Uh, there are more and more people who are joining, and we are running this organization. We need to have some sort of a rule set. And by rule set, I don't mean just procedures, processes, but also tools, but also mechanisms, alert, run books. And in general, I call it an operating system of the organization. And it's made of many, many, many different ingredients. Some of them are listed here on this slide. So the actual architecture of this platform is, is just one of those things. What about the quality assurance? How does it work? How does it scale? What about, for instance, the actual release management? Because release management is not just deployment. What if the, we are bringing in the new functionality and the users are completely caught off guard? They haven't expected that. They don't know how to operate with that. We should somehow let them know. This is the part of release management. Uh, what, and, and when your organization is growing, you already have some people 
you also probably promise them something in some way. For instance, uh, everyone would like to have some sort of feedback, and they, they earn some money, they would like some remuneration process to, uh, uh, which reflects their development as individuals. So that's also part of this operating system. So this is probably the latest moment when you have to start thinking about that. And from pe for people who come from traditional organization, it sounds like this is HR job. Well, no. <laughs> in a small organization, especially in a startup, it's typically not HR job because there is no HR. It's, it's still, it's the job of someone who is in charge of the technology. So that's how it works. And I said that the architecture of the actual platform, which you operate now, now, right now, is just one of those points. And this architecture is also f getting far more complex, just, not just because we are adding more and more components, <laughs> but also because there are things which in old good 90s we called NFRs, non-functional requirements. And right now, these days, we typically call them ETs. So uh, these are availabilities, recoverabilities, uh, scalabilities, maintainabilities, and so on, so on. So these are additional concerns which are related to the architecture. And each, for each business, there are they have different weights. So in some case, for instance, uh, the scalability is most important. In some case, it's maybe securability, not security, securability. In some cases, it's maybe, for instance, operability, because this is a multi-tenant solution that you deploy in the accounts of your clients, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, so those things do not get implemented automatically. This is the moment when maybe you haven't been thinking about those, because what you have been is just senior developer who didn't have to think about those, this stuff. And having them on your rider right now doesn't mean that you have to design all of that on your own. It just means that you need to find someone who will do. So we need to delegate it, or you need to identify someone who will help with that, or who will cover that. And again, another book. Like, this one is super good. So if you really think about building a modern organization, I strongly recommend High Growth Handbook. The, I said that Marty Kagan's book are about building product-driven organization. So it's a perspective of organization which is supposed to be driven by purpose. So this one doesn't really contradict with that, but it's more about how it's being built operationally. So how do you build high-performing organization, especially uh, for, for, for startups? And finally, there's a moment, hopefully, if you, if you are really succeeding, if you are really doing very, very good, it's a moment when when you need to grow organizationally. So probably your product becomes several products, your teams, your sites become several sites. You need to hire a, in, in different countries. Uh, you, you actually need, f you have far more concerns than you can address because of your technical proneness. Uh, so that's the moment when you are scaling out very rapidly in some case, especially if you get a good funding. And then you cannot talk to everyone individually and you cannot inspect personally everything within your organization. This happens faster than you actually may think. So uh, this is the moment when you need to start thinking, and here are the key concerns. How do we do things in parallel in the relatively independent teams? Uh, how do we release the products which are according to different backlogs in the same time while still being coherent? How to do that? And the most imp interesting one, how, who owns what? Because it, typically many organizations start with some internal open source. So like there's a shared code base and everyone can do everything, which is healthy. But at some point, will it still work? Who will own everything? If there is an, an outage, 3 a.m. in the morning, and the outage is visible in some part of the system which has plenty of dependencies, how do we know where is the root cause? Or how do we know who should be woken? <laughs> who should address the issue? So there are plenty of uh, things to self-reflect upon. Uh, what's uh, our logical composition uh, of our product? Does it still correspond to our organization? Or maybe we need to reorganize the organization? And the changes that we, for instance, do in a particular part of the product, how do we communicate them to the rest of the organization? This can be also quite, be quite tricky. And here's the one, I said that there will be a few controversial things, and that's the first one of them. Uh, we are all taught that there are very few things worse than the technical debt. Maybe death, maybe taxes. 
Uh, but in fact, uh, I will say something, yeah, controversial. So the technical depth in startups, it's not necessarily bad. It's just a tool. And it's a tool that you use in a trade. Why so? Because in some cases, you urgently need, for instance, speed. And you need to make a conscious decision of how to preserve or gain this speed. Because this is the absolutely highest priority. So it's a trade. And please do not misinterpret technical debt as bad engineering. Because if we just do some mistakes, maybe we didn't know something, maybe we've done some shortcuts because we didn't know better, maybe we lacked experience, this is not a technical debt. Well, it may have very similar symptoms, but it's not a technical debt, it's just bad engineering. So there is nothing to be shamed about when it comes to technical debt, if you think about it this way. So, for instance, I was really surprised when I started talking to engineering managers in some larger scale-ups that they actually have this paradigm of designing this, the, the way of thinking about how to design the systems, they actually design it for a rewrite. So they are okay with accumulating the debt because the way the system is composed is based on a very strong contracts. Which means that if the contracts are phrased with the business concepts, with, which do not change that frequently, and the abstractions, the implementation abstractions are not leaking, it's relatively easy to rewrite a part of the software which is behind such contract. Uh, in, in The Elegant Puzzle, which is also a very good book by Will Larson, actually I don't have a slide about it, uh, it's even explicitly written, there is a whole chapter about rewriting. So how do you do rewriting? What are, what are, when do you know that the piece of your software expires? Because the piece of your software should have an expiry date, just like the products that you buy in the grocery. Uh, I, I've, I've said a lot about scaling the organization. And if you want to learn uh, or get some inspirations about scaling, here are two good books. Yeah, I started with slides with one book, and here are the ones with which two books. So the one on the left is actually quite famous, so probably many of you have already seen that. It's the book that presents a very interesting mental model about how to design the organization. So it uh, presents some archetypes of the teams with their, which, with their roles, which really helps you to design the organization that will be large and still well organized. And the other one, Accelerate, is completely different. It's actually a scientific book where Dr. Nicole Forsgren, with some associates, he actually took like shitloads of data from the high-performing organizations and she analyzed them to find the common denominator what makes a highly performing organization. So she listed all the practices and analyzed who does what to find out whether there are some patterns. Uh, you may question the, her actual approach, her method, but the outcome is actually very interesting. So again, highly recommended. Okay, so we started with some sort of a journey, but let's talk about a few things that distinguish startups. So uh, once I've met a startup CTO, actually I didn't ask him whether I can call him by name here, so that's why here's an anonymized picture. Uh, but uh, we had a conversation and, and basically he told me, do you know that my competition has 100 times more money than I have? So do you know how we compete with them? And the answer is here on the slide, that we compete with them by having 100 times more focus. And that's super important. And what does it mean to have more focus? It means picking your battles wisely. Because if you start with nothing, your startup doesn't have anything, you cannot build everything in the same time, you need to make sure that you are not being distracted with things that are basically meaningless. This is one huge piece of startup DNA, of modern organization DNA that is worth mentioning. Uh, if, if you want to learn more about this mindset of uh, being oriented for growth, not for profitability, there's a very good book created by uh, co-creators of, I think, PayPal and LinkedIn, Reid Hoffman. That's the guy who has famously created the very first book uh, written together with ChatGPT. But th that's not this book. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, so one thing is focus, one thing is avoiding distraction. Another concept which has many names, I call it development agility. Uh, this is basically 
your velocity. It's more about velocity. It's more about speed than actual agility. Uh, it's the velocity of making a unit atomic change in your organization. Because startups need to pivot. They need to change direction. They need to be very, I would say, uh, agile in that. And how do you achieve that? Here, are those points are listed on the screen. So yeah, definitely with simplicity, with as short feedback loop as possible, with avoiding uh, dependencies, and so on, so on. But uh, this sounds like very, something very obvious, but I think that the most, more interesting slide is this one. Because this one is about so-called boiling frogs. So the things that decrease our development agility, and we do not notice them in many cases. So for instance, slow builds. We are getting used to that, because our builds get slow incrementally, step by step, day by day, week by week. And those things slow down everyone in, the, in our organization. But there are more of those things here. Like breaking builds, not being able to detect a breaking build, for instance. Or some manual gating. What does it mean, manual gating? Manual processes, where someone is an improver. Do we really need them? Maybe there's a better way. Yes, there's always a better way. Uh, problems with versioning. Or the last two points are actually about over-engineering solutions. So some flexibility that we as engineers notice that it would be nice to add it because we will need it in the future, while in fact we will never need it. So these are the things that uh, you should avoid, not only in startups, but you should avoid in the organization which really aims to, to move fast. That's something that should be the part of this organization. Uh, that, that's something that you as a CTO of such an organization should be actually exemplifying. Uh, right now, we are moving to more controversial stuff. It's a very good uh, quote by Elad Gill. He was already mentioned uh, during, uh, because of one recommendation of his book. Startups are hard. For the very first few years of a company, forward momentum is largely due to founders pushing every day. And the word which is worth emphasizing here is pushing. And that really means that as a startup CTO, you're actually supposed to be a spiritus movers of the organization. You're supposed to make people want <laughs> doing things. Uh, you're supposed to create this healthy dose of pressure. Uh, again, some inspiration about the pressure. This book is actually very interesting because this is about pressure, but not from the perspective of someone who applies pressure, but from someone who is a subject of this pressure. So if you are interested in the uh, psychology of pressure, this is probably something that you should take a look on. And yes, when we talk about pressure, then probably you, you, some of you may object that, you know, this is 2023. This is not ancient Egypt anymore. And people have different expectations. Where is our four days uh, work week, right? So, uh, yeah, speaking about controversies. Mm. Uh, startup is something very specific. So it's not just about the technology, it's about being an entrepreneur. And in some cases, it means that you may actually be facing your lifetime opportunity. It doesn't happen each time, of course, but sometimes it's happened. And in such a case, it's a question that you need to answer yourself. Uh, do I want to try it? Do I want to bet more on that? And this is what this guy, uh, who is quite toxic, by the way, but this is what, what, uh, what is written in this particular tweet, that if you really want, if you really have a great opportunity, then maybe uh, you should actually use that. But uh, you're not the only person in the organization, because you have your team. As a CTO, you are responsible for the all engineering organization. And here, you need to be honest with those people. And this is what I mean by social contract. So, for instance, you can go to your people and tell them, you know, we're going to build something here which will be very ambitious. And we have some basis to think that this may be groundbreaking, this may be a great success. Here are my points. Here is my vision. If you believe this vision, let's talk about what we all can commit to achieve this vision. 
Because I will be honest with you, this is the part of the social contract, I will be honest with you. The next few months, maybe one year, maybe even more, this will be blood, sweat, and tears. But if we do the shit right, we may be millionaires, or we may achieve something else. And of course, there is always risk that this will not happen. And those conditions will not be pleasant. Some people may break, but that's the plan. So here's the question to you. <laughs> I will jump out of the role. Uh, if, if there is a CTO, if there is a person, if there is another Elon who comes with such a message, is it okay or not? Is it a fair message or not? From my perspective, this is a very fair message. This is what he's supposed to do. Uh, this message or this commitment will not be ac acceptable for many people. That's truth. But he puts that in advance. He, this is the offer he puts on the table. Th this is, uh, if, you, if you, for instance, hear the word workaholic, you think about some sort of pathology, right? <laughs> you think about some crazy person. But if you see Cristiano Ronaldo on the screen, you think, Wow, what's amazing, what an amazing sports person, who's actually a workaholic. <laughs> it's one of the worst workaholics that you can bring in as an example. And in his case, it was simple. He was one person, large organization. So it was his own decision, his own commitment, his own uh, greed to achieve that. In startup, it's not just you. It's the team. And it may require incredible amount of effort. And especially in a highly competitive environment. And it's okay if you are open about that. If you are fair about that, if you communicate this initially, beforehand, and if people commit to that consciously. That's what social contract is about. It's one of the very hardest things that you do as a leader in general, not just as a startup CTO, not just as any CTO. And what is in this social contract? Because social contract is a conceptual term. It's not really a written contract. This is just a set of rules we all agree upon. For instance, what are we paid for? Am I paid for being somewhere for eight hours? Or am I paid for results? Am I paid for effort? Am I paid for actually what? That's one of the questions. Another question may be, what are the boundaries of the commitment? So what is expected from everyone? Where do we set those boundaries? Because this is norm absolutely normal that there will be some people who already have families, who already have very important things in their life, and for instance, more than 40 hours per week is absolutely not acceptable for them. I respect that. But there may be other ones who will see this as an opportunity because they don't want to work anymore after 30. <laughs> So they want to use this opportunity right now. And they are ready to work for 80 hours. And if those people have no agreement and they are in the very same room, at some point there may be a disagreement between them. Because some of them may think, we are putting far more sweat into that. How far is that? Should we be compensated in a different way? Yeah, so I think that this is one of the good examples of questions that should be asked beforehand not after the shit hits the fan. Uh, another concept which is very important in defining the social contract is actual skin in the game. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with the concept. If not, you will see the next slide. Uh, but the skin in the game is basically about uh, not being a person who is employed in the organization, but being partially a co-owner of something. So being responsible in a good way and in a bad way. What do I mean? In a good way, it means that if this succeeds, I also benefit additionally because it succeeds. And in a bad way means that if it goes down, I also suffer because it goes down, which means that I participate in wins and in losses. So how could you, for instance, have some skin in the game? Well, because, of course, by having some shares. So yes, Elon may have like 50%, but what if the core development team has like 1% each? This is still, this may, may be something worth fighting for. Uh, yeah, so if you want to read about skin in the game as a concept and how it works in practice and how it can be applied in all the spheres of our life, including, for instance, politics, because why not? Then I strongly recommend this book. 
if you can tolerate Nassim Tal Nicolas Nassim Taleb, which is quite a specific person. Anyway, uh, one more thing. Uh, it's, as a CTO, especially when you are in the role for the very first time, it may be very lonely at the top. Because people expect you to be right. People expect you to make good decisions. And in general, you are go-to person with, where something is wrong. So we are accountable for literally everything. And what's even more tricky, and you may not have realized it yet, you are actually, even if you are initially successful, you are expected to grow together with the organization. So initially, maybe you are fine, because you've already managed a team of 10. So we have 10 developers and everything is good. But then, the, the, everything is good, the organization is growing, and suddenly you have 50 developers. And you are for the very first time in this organization, and you are still expected to do well. This can be really uncomfortable. Uh, so uh, my, my advice here, or my suggestion here, is that do not try to fix upon your misery. <laughs> Actually, try to network. There are other people who are in the, same or in, in the same situation. Try to reach out. Those people are looking for networking. And here is a small advertisement. I've mentioned in the very beginning that we do run such a thing, which is called CTO Morning Coffee. We organize people who are technical, uh, senior technical leaders or who aspire to be senior technical leaders and who would like to speak about such things. Okay, so I, I said about a uh, few things that are important if you are thinking about being a senior technical leader or thinking about uh, organizing a startup, but what about mistakes? What are the, most, uh, the worst mistakes you can make while being in this position? Well, there are many candidates here, but I have few. Well, so first of all, uh, you absolutely need to stop thinking about uh, clean code, beautiful architecture, engineering perfectionism, and this stuff. Uh, you need to think pragmatically. You are building the business. You have a limited runway. Your money is running out. You are not profitable. And you start from scratch. You start from nothing. Uh, you, you really should embrace some concepts and you should really be okay with going some shortcuts because perfectionism actually is a, is a ticket to hell. Uh, another concept which is very bad, and unfortunately I notice it uh, at, for some people who come from the service organizations or for some, from some larger organization, is the concept of the technical success. So there are people who come and say that well, we succeeded, we've implemented everything, but uh, those business guys, they're idiots. And this had no chance to succeed since the very beginning. But well, our job is to implement. We are developers. We've developed what they wanted us to develop, but it failed. So business-wise, it's a failure, but technology-wise, it's a success. So this kind of thinking obviously has no chance to work in the startup. You're building not a technology project, you're building the product. You're building something which is supposed to be used by people. Uh, measuring, I've already mentioned that. that it's in the beginning, when the organization is small and you can ins inspect everything, and you, you are a domain expert, hopefully, then uh, your intuition actually can be relied upon for some time. But at some point, you need to start measuring things. Otherwise, you're acting blindly. I've mentioned focus. So what's the antithesis of having focus? Well, one of the examples is poorly handled build versus buy dilemma. If you take a look at every technical problem, as an experienced engineer, we are probably quite sure that we can do this in weekend. We can implement it on our own. Why should we pay the cloud provider for this shit? We can do this. Uh, and typically, yes, we can, but we completely omit some additional costs, like costs of maintenance, that would appear quite soon. So that's why uh, making good build versus buy decisions is actually essential in this role. And in general, there's also a concept of the whole culture. So uh, making sure that we all follow the same social contract, that we all follow the same mechanism that we've set up, like decision-making mechanisms. Uh, because the more people, the harder it is to communicate, the harder it is to align everyone, and intuitively, we react with micromanaging and with making ourselves a bottleneck, which, of course, uh, is, is another path to damnation. Let's try to wrap, wrap it up. A few most important points that uh, are applicable not only in this role. So uh, 
Yeah, as a CTO, you probably can wear many hats, and you may not be comfortable with wearing all of those. So that's okay. That's absolutely okay. As long as you make sure that someone wears those hats. So find that person. Uh, some say that uh, you may find you may hire your next boss. That's one of the of the of the ideas. But you can just delegate some of the things. Uh, another one. I, I cannot emphasize that more. Pick your battles wisely. Just be like mid journey. <laughs> Find the good questions to be answered instead of like following the autopilot. Uh, yeah, have a good decision-making framework. Otherwise, you will end up as a bottleneck very, very quickly. Uh, if you feel that this is taking off, if you feel that this may be big, and if you want to utilize this lifetime opportunity, design the social contract and talk honestly with all your, all your people so they know what they commit to, and this is their decisions in the end. Learn to measure things as early as possible. Use the technical debt as a tool, not don't be afraid of technical debt. And in the end, remember that everyone will be looking at you. So you are supposed to push things through. You are supposed to be an exemplification of how this, how this organization should operate. You will be a role model for the engineers in the organization. Thank you very much. That's it. Uh, if you wanted to take more pictures of the recommendations, there's a link to the slides, the orange one here, so feel free to take a picture right now. Uh, if you are interested in uh, technical leadership, feel free to join our meetings. There is a link, CTO Morning Coffee here. The meetings happen on Twitter Spaces. If you have any other questions or you would like to talk about whatever was in the presentation or the technolo technology leadership in general, feel free to use those social links to contact me directly. And that's it. Thank you very much. I think I've run out of time, so un unfortunately we don't have time for a slide. Sorry for that, but feel free to grab me at the corridor. Thank you.